Shalija. Uh, as you are aware, Nosh, Dr. Shalija Fennell is Director of Research at Cambridge Central Asia Forum. And she's also teaching developmental studies. Uh, uh, she's a fellow of Jesus College, University of Cambridge. Uh, she's a visiting professor at Kazan National University. Uh, her research, uh, doctoral research, was on long term agriculture trends in India and China. And uh, what she has been pursuing over the years, looking at the linkages with rural development, environment, education studies in India, China, and Central Asia since 2004. Now, these are some of the issues you know, in ICS uh, that we have been uh, pursuing uh, with great deal of interest. In fact, uh, as I told you in the uh, last, uh, last month, the last month we had uh, released a book by our uh, fellow, honorary fellow, Professor Kanwadin Mohanty. This is on uh, China's uh, transformation, uh, uh, you know, looking at both success aspect of it and also how success becomes a trap. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at various issues, but the particular focus on uh, rural development that we should uh, give you a copy of that book. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, today, uh, I request uh, Shailja will be speaking on challenge of sustainable cities, nature of rural urban transitions, and implications for inclusion in China and India. Here again, you know, I think <coughs> one uh, aspect of work that we particularly emphasize uh, relates to comparative studies between India and China. And uh, this is one uh, area I think we hope to, to focus on uh, in the coming year, you know, organization, uh, migration from a uh, countryside to urban areas, and particular challenges faced by the migrant communities. Uh, of course, you know, China is a huge number. We are looking at you know, something like <coughs> 300 you know, million people who have migrated. And they have some structural uh, <coughs> constraints uh, which perhaps we don't have in India, you know, the ecosystem and uh, uh, But India also, we have our own set of problems. I believe you'll be looking at you know, comparative. Com comparative as also issues relating to employment and inclusion. So I request you know, um, Dr. Fennell to uh, make a presentation. I believe she has a PowerPoint presentation. And she you can take the whole time and then we'll have a Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashok, for inviting me. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to talk about India and China in Delhi. Uh, when I was a student at Delhi University, this was an unimagined thing. Um, we had people studying Indian development, we had people studying Chinese language, but the twain never met. And so this is an absolutely marvelous opportunity, and I think institutions like ICS, and we hope very much going forward. Um, the college I'm a fellow at, Jesus, has just uh, approved India-China studies as an important program and we hope very much that this will be the first but definitely not the last opportunity that we have to meet as a group and discuss these very important issues. I'll try and speak for about 40 minutes so that people have a chance for questions. And I'm not give, going to read a paper out because I haven't had a chance to circulate and that would be unfair. So there are a couple of slides which are graphs and some pictures and some words so that hopefully it gets a conversation going. I'd just like to mention the key words and why they're on this slide. Um, as Ashok pointed out very kindly, that the challenge and the opportunity going forward in, in the, our research groups to think about youth and what they wish to do. And we think that this is a, a very attractive way in which one can put together cross-disciplinary research, which then, particularly in the context of India and China, is less prickly as an issue for, for governments. And that's one reason that we regard this as important. But second, we're not entirely sure that we, the older generation, both in India and China, so I say this uh, based on conversations at Beida, Tsinghua, and Shanghai Jiatong as well, um, we are aware that we need to engage with that next generation to learn what their aspirations are, but also to transfer knowledge across to them of the things that we know are the classic models of development in India and China. So it's a kind of mutual exchange, and then an exchange across comparisons. Rural urban transitions actually bring the two countries together very strongly, 
And people always ask when I did my PhD looking at rural reform in India and China, but you can't compare these two countries. One's a democracy, one's a dictatorship. My answer always was, yes, but they both have poor people in rural areas. And I think that what's really interesting in the last 30 years is the way that that trajectory of development in India and China has had some similarities, big similarities in terms of thinking about the growth of cities in the last 10 years. But most particularly, that demography, that shift, that the median age in India is 26 today, the median age in China is 31. They are two countries with large absolute populations of youth, and that makes it uh, important. However, the current discussion in both these countries about this transfer from rural to urban tends to be around the word smart. Now, in mm. India, we pride ourselves on the idea of the smart city. China's been doing the same thing, and it's around data, it's around digital, it's around the urban space. But when a lot of people are coming from rural to urban, is that a sustainable model? Is it enough just to talk about technology? Do we need to also look at the skill sets of these rural youth who are moving to cities and how they will engage with this new paradigm? So, just very quickly, you know, the world became urban in 2007. Half the world is urban. If we map that, it also meant the world is less rural. Just remind ourselves it means, however, 30% of the world is still going to be rural in 2050. And these two large countries of 1.3 billion each are going to bear quite a large part of that rural population. And this is the slide that's really interesting. In 2050, projections from the UN will argue that, look at that urban population. India will be 875 million urban. China's going to be over a billion urban. So we're talking about still rapid shifts occurring. And in that context, I use my, my first point about youth unemployment. This is not a challenge for developing countries alone. This is a global challenge. We've now reached a point where growth without employment, zero employment growth, is quite common in countries. The country in which I work and live in the UK is one such country. And so the ILO in recent years has helped us. It's brought out some useful data that a majority of those who are excluded from employment for a number of structural reasons, as I short to mention, are going to be in not just developing countries, but in the youth are going to be at least growing up in the rural region and then moving out. So really, for countries that we have looked at in the previous slide were urbanizing rapidly, we need to think about new opportunities. Something that I'll speak about at the end of my presentation is the current ideas on skilling that we have in terms of youth population. We really need to think through how is it that educated youth populations can find the jobs that they want. And sometimes I call that the three gap model. There's an educational gap, there's a skill gap, and there's an employment gap. India and China have done well on the educational gap compared to the other two. They have a lot more young people entering the educational system. The questions really are what happens when they exit, at what point do they exit, and what real skills do they have. And so, there are also structural challenges in that adult population, more so in India than in China, and that is though girls are educated much more than boys, there is still a gap in terms of entering the employment market. So I'm not going to say for a moment that India and China are identical, but there is something worth learning from each other. We might be doing better in terms of AI, they might be better doing better in gender equality. Let's try and understand what we can learn from each other, as Ashok said. And so, what's going to happen is that young people are, are angry across the world. They're not going to get the jobs that their parents have. And as I said, I, I say this with humility because this is a European problem at the moment. It's a huge problem for us in Europe. And in some ways, maybe in India, China, we should be less worried because we never had formal employment for the majority of the population anyway. And I say this only half in jest, because I think this is actually quite true. The fact that a majority of our youth are not in the formal sector means, while I am all for improving a minimum wage for youth, the idea of using a model where you have 75% of the formal sector talking about pensions which the government will give, talking about housing which the government will give, is a complete travesty if you're going to think about what's feasible for us. So reports are coming out, McKinsey, others, we have lots of people coming to India, studying countries like India and China, 
and this is a global study from Japan across to Turkey, it, it makes the point that in, the, in, in educational institutions really do not have the ability to provide the skills for the future. In particular, being an economist, I'm going to focus on this lack of matching between demand and supply. The second point, that you have education, people get out of school, dare I say sitting so close to Delhi University, you get 100%, you still don't get admission in Delhi University. So, what, what are we saying in terms of where people are coming from and where they go from? The two categories they have are, are interesting, too cool to school, um, which is a first world problem, and I say that in quotes and so many jokes on first world problems, but we also have the two cool to study. So we've got an interesting moment where we put a lot of effort into education, but there's a way to go. And I, now I'm going to talk about that divide in space. <laughs> It's interesting, and for those of you, is anyone an economist in the room? So we were taught something called the Lewis model, uh, which said that people move to cities, and they're working in factories, and their lives will be better. In inequality terms, rather than wages and terms, <coughs> cities are more unequal. And that's something that we didn't think about in the 70s and 80s. We talk about the informal sector, people in slums should be upgraded, but the fact that the ladder is much longer in an urban space is something, as more people are coming in, is the bottom of the ladder going to grow faster than the top of the ladder is something worth thinking about. And this is across the world again. Um, and if it's like this in high-income countries, and we did some research in the last two years using Asian Development Bank data for what it would it be for the BRICS, the emergent economies. And, and we say this because our concern is, if cities are supposed to be that golden uh, attraction and inequality is rising, then we need to think about it now. Not when we have 87 million living in urban in 15 years. The moment is now. That window is small, it's open, but we need to deal with it now. And so we have lots of language in development, inclusive, safe, resilient. They're, they're difficult. They're not easy to do. And the current drivers we think of production and productivity are not delivery. So we've got to think about innovation and enterprise. And, and this, this is hard because it's outside a single disciplinary space and we like looking, looking at things in disciplines. So, yes, cities are attracted to poor people. They might give them a better life, but I underline might. Simply by moving people to cities, you're not going to give them a better life. And if you look at some of the data... Uh, okay. um, yeah. So... Here's the data that we were able to do, to work on, looking at Asian Development Bank, the end of the last millennium, and you can see if you look at quintile population, so one-fifth population, and we put the Gini coefficients for them, it's risen across, and, and just in terms of calculation, we're looking at the top one-fifth and bottom one-fifth. But China has gone from 5.1 to 9.6. It's the fastest growing for the longest period, inequality has just gone Top fifth, bottom fifth. How much the top fifth earn and the bottom fifth? The inequality. So just take what percentage the top fifth earn as a percentage of their size to their income. Right. China is way above at 9.6. Um, that's like Brazilian rates. And Brazil is the most unequal in the world. So we're looking at something really interesting and which is happening as we speak. And, and, and that's worth, worth thinking about. So the top 20%, the bottom. And we don't normally do this, we just look at genies, and genies don't give us this contradiction, this cheek by jowl, these massive golden buildings in Shanghai, and people two hours down the road living under a flyover. Yeah, and, and, and in Delhi, it's even more cheek by jowl. Outside Jane, you've got the flyover, and you've got fancy housing, you've got people living under a flyover. So. The other thing, again, to see how this is talking about the way growth is changing, is that across the world, within the country, inequality is now. Uh, important consideration. It hasn't fallen from 77 only to 70, so we're growing, we're moving to cities, but inequality is not automatically falling through the growth process. The point being, interventions in health and education, things that many of you might be interested in, really need to be focused on in the BRICS world, and in particular in the India-China space. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues at Cambridge, who did work for um, Globally, in terms of inequality, makes this argument in terms of the richest 5% and the poorest 40%. And again, if you look at the BRICS world in relation to that, you can see that the figures are quite stable over the last five years. So we may have had the growth, we may be patting ourselves on the back for that, but we're not shifting the structural constraint. 
I'm not going to belabor that point, but really the evidence is, and, and we did interviews and some of our colleagues did, do with policy makers in Asia. And it's interesting that they, only half of them are concerned about this rising inequality. So we can't expect to say that policy makers are going to drive this. And I think there's a real need for academic consideration on this. <coughs> If we continue with that inequality that we saw at the end of the 20th century, only 240 million people will be moved out of poverty. If we increase it, it could be far more. So there's, a, there's an opportunity. I'm going to move to India and China. I haven't forgotten I'm talking about that. And here, let me move to the regions. The first of the, the two indicators I want to look at using Asian <coughs> Development Bank data is education. And, and, and we, we see something worrying. South Asia as a whole, Education expenditure percentage of government expenditure does not mean education expenditure is falling. But when government expenditure increases, education expenditure is not growing at the same rate. And this is important for inequality measures. It's not how many desks and chairs, it's are you being able to meet uh, the, the growth that's occurring in the future. So we're already slipping. East Asia is slightly better. But and if I take the health expenditure, which Mother Rima works on, it's not a dissimilar story. We're pretty much of a muchness in Asia in terms of that. But what does that do for us as, as countries? Well, it does mean, and the Asian Development Bank wrote a report on this because it was sufficiently concerned, that spatial inequality is something we need to look at as a category of research. If you're in rural and urban, and I just come back from Chandigarh, and my mind is slightly blown. There are villages with three floor buildings and a gown with, uh, with, with fields. Is that rural? Is that urban? Is that urban? Is that peri-urban? <coughs> I call it urban agriculture, and there's not a category that, of that in the census at the moment. So that puzzle is really important. It's not just there is a village and there is a town. <coughs> there is everything from tier one cities to tier six uh, towns to outgrowth of the town to the village. And that outgrowth of the town to the village is what I see in Zapi, Pura, Zai, and Fields? Three, four buildings, <coughs> quite a sewage because it's still classified as large rural land. So you have some really puzzling things going on. And if we've thought about digging deeper, the same thing happens in China. So Chongqing, 25 million, you get out, you go towards rural, and suddenly you're thinking, there are all these flats. Or all these farmers are not living in these flats. So the way in which planners think about development and housing, and, and alongside that, the facilities of health and education, seem to be at odds, and I put it mildly, at odds with what most of us are working on the ground as researchers see. And so I'm going to talk about two types, just illustrative, two types of structural disadvantages. As Ashok said, I'm going to look at the implications of the Foucault, uh, particularly in terms of migrant Foucaults, in terms of the education migrant space. So those of you, many of you probably are much more knowledgeable than me, but there's been a shift in the last 10 years. So earlier, children would stay in the urban Foucault migratory space with their parents till they were about seven or eight, and then they would go home. But parents are now concerned if they do that, the children actually start falling behind by the time they're 11 years of age. They take three years to just reintegrate with the rural community. And there's no way they're going to take the gao kao, which is the exam that they have to do at the end of it. So they're trying to get their children to stay longer. Now this becomes challenging because the cost of education rises. And Shanghai and Beijing governments are, are, are thinking through this in different ways. So in, in Beijing, they're creating different schools for migrant kids. In Shanghai, they're actually creating different classrooms in the same school migrant kids. And the reason they're doing this is because they, they have different strategies on how the future is going to be. So for Shanghai, they're thinking, when you become 25 million, we'll close the door. And then these kids need to skill up because they're going to have to get jobs in the urban space. Beijing being slightly later in the migration story is thinking more, OK, let's keep them out. Let's, let's zone them. And so here you get a so-called monolith Chinese state. But because education is policy of the city, different policy structures. And why does this matter? Because you can continue having education inequality despite expanding. And China is seeing this. And we are happy to note that Beijing and Shanghai administrations say they do not mind if you work in this space now. We've got approval after working for four years on the outside. So it's an interesting space. What happens? If you look at types of inequality, and Ashok and I were chatting about this mother and before, there is a major difference in a number of features. Inequalities between 2010 and 2014, this is the latest data we have from the government. The inequality in medical insurance has fallen, but the inequality in maternity insurance has not. 
So within that same sector, what you get money for depends. And so a lot of migrant women have very difficult but so they have no one to support them and very little. So just, just to give you, you can do the whole thing and then you can still get inequalities by, by categories. In India, we have also a gendered inequality and that is, and the, you know, this is our own data, NFHS. And it, it's interesting because here again, you have a category here. It's not by location, it's by caste. But it's another structural disadvantage. So what we need to think is that we can't learn directly from each other. But it, it's worth thinking about how would one try and, and address these issues. So uh, this is my only academic slide. Uh, I, I'm making an argument to you really about differences and inequality. That if differences can be read as diversity, and we recognize in terms of democracy every human being is different but equally, uh, equally is each, and they are equal, different but equal. And if we think about how one thinks about individual difference as consequential on lives, that the differences affect who you are. So if you're a rural woman in Gansu, your life's very different from you in Chongqing. So that gets structured through social inequalities and interactions as a permanent marker. There's nothing, a five-year-old kid going to Shanghai is not any different from a five-year-old kid whose parents already live in Shanghai. But through that educational experience of being out in a different classroom or having to go back, they lose out. So there's a kind of deficit that they're acquiring with each year. And that's the idea I'm trying to get us to think about conception. And I started talking about these things two years ago in, in, in China. And I actually spoke in Moktaba like this. I spoke to a bunch of architects in Tsinghua University. Because they were involved in drawing up new housing and I said, like, like, where's the primary health center? And where's the school? And they went, oh, the government did you not. You measure how so far it is from where you're building. And we've got a survey ongoing at the moment in Beijing on that. So we're not saying that we have the answers, but we're not in permission to work in these spaces to start thinking about these issues. And because we're working with the working Delhi University of China with really bright young people, and my point about youth is therefore youth working with youth. We're talking about those of us in both countries who have the opportunity to work at university as being the group that will work with the youth judge. And that conversation is essential. With an old lady like me with white hair, whether I'm in China or not, they're just polite to me. They don't tell me the story because, you know, what does she know? Quite right. So this is a methodological engagement that we're increasingly trying to engage with. 25 to 30, talking to 25 to 30. <coughs> So what does that do? Well, we now think that we might be in a place, unlike before, where we can begin to use cities as a research site for inclusive economic development by this methodology of engagement. And that we could, and maybe that's what Monomanthi is doing as well, both success and failure. Let's not disregard the failures. The fact that Shanghai and Beijing haven't got it right is the opportunity to try and study why rather than, you know, what's the model, can we replicate? You can't replicate a model across the Chinese provinces. It's just not possible, and I don't think we could in India. So, if we can understand the skill sets that young people have or don't have, then in a world where my slide on movement to urban shows that young people are moving to the city, looking for the factory jobs that don't exist, we might be able to catch them when they're 14, 15, 16, making that decision of where their skill sets need to go. And so this is a, we were able to draw a map because we actually have access to 110 urban village data. And we mapped where, where these villages were in, in Beijing. It was, a, it was a challenge and people say, oh, you know, it's been working in India, you can't do so. The same thing in China. They want to know what you're asking the migrants. So when we said we're asking the migrants what they want to do, they said, oh, yes, that's very good, we don't know. If we'd said instead we're asking the migrants, you know, the fact they're cutting, not paying their pensions, then we'd have been out. <laughs> but what's really interesting is that cluster in Beijing municipality are very valuable pieces of land. So cast your mind back to Mumbai. Think about Mumbai and what was happening in the central business district where you had old mills and you were trying to reuse <coughs> them. Well. The reason people are interested in these spaces is because there's a shared value proposition. I'm going to move to us. So in China, rather than going back to the old rag chair nagi TVs and the TVs don't work and there are problems, I'm asking the question a different way. There are new movements among 
<coughs> urban populations. In China, we're studying them in the urban villages. In India, there is rural to rural migration, increasingly replacing rural to urban migration. So all those Bihari workers who are sitting outside, Chandigarh, normally to Panchkula and working, never get to the city in Punjab. They move from rural Bihar to rural Punjab, and that's where they are. So we need to change the way we think about city and rural. It's not going to be any point talking to youth who are living in the city center. When I say city now, I mean the city all the way to the village. So this outgrowth category is, is the one that I'm thinking. So I'll wrap up my final few slides before I just give a little bit of what we did. The other thing is that this means internal migration rates are actually only increasing slightly. Because the way we measured people as rural to city, we haven't measured the rural to rural. So we actually think migration is falling, but the because of the data coverage, but the projections are migration is going to rise. And it's that lack of study of the space between the village and the tier three, tier four, where a lot of the exciting things are going on. And we don't have... China is not here? Sorry? In that slide, China is not here? No, Chinese have not provided data. So. I see. But they do, this will go on. Yeah. So I'm going to end with this idea of, of course, smart cities. Smart cities is something that's important. We need data points in the mm -hmm. urban space. But a smart grid and smet of digital devices is not a sufficient condition for thinking about what a smart city is. We need to start the narrative of smart in the villages. We need to think about that more in terms of the human dimension of data, what people want. In particular, I, being a, someone looking at rural urban transition, I'm interested in two things. Productivity in agriculture will not occur unless you diversify into non-agriculture. It's already actually happening on the ground. It's just that we keep saying, we know from our last research we did in Punjab and Tamil Nadu, young people don't want to be farmers. So they want to stay in the rural space, but they don't want to be farmers. Only, and with the MSP price, MSP price argument, there's a lot of reason that they wouldn't want to be farmers. So we're thinking about using a narrative which is currently very popular in both India and China, the smart city narrative. To link it to, if you want smart cities, you need to think about the skill sets of young people who are going to be populating your cities in the future. Particularly in terms of what you invest in them, education and health. So I'll end by saying that this argument is a two-way process. It prevents us thinking about the city and the village as two polar ends, which is a one-way movement from city to village. We can see people moving back and forth. Just a little bit. So we had our first narrative on smart cities in Bhubaneswar two years ago when Bhubaneswar was declared to be a smart city. And that, of course, is Samantaji who runs Kit and Kiss University. And we said we want to hold it in the university because we want to talk to the tribal youth. So we had a conversation with them. Bhubaneswar is only one million. It's a city that's going to grow very fast, particularly with initiatives like Kit and Kiss. If more tribal youth are going to come and study in Bhubaneswar and Korakot, they're going to want to work in and around there. So it's a beginning, we hope, to map some of those spaces in the next four years. Um, I went to Rachi. Uh, I did the same thing as a conversation in Ranchi, and I did it because we wanted to work with tribal kids here as well. Most of these tribal kids <coughs> want to be engineers or policemen. Lots of them want to be policemen. This teacher only came to the school two days before I arrived to do my field work. And they've been trying for two months to get a teacher to come to the school. So when we say, oh, the educational problem is solved, it isn't. We, we still have a lot of work so the back ending doesn't kind of fall out. So what does that mean? And we just launched, one of the reasons I'm here is we just launched a project for four years with the Department of Biotechnology on something called Global Challenges Fund. And our fund is thinking about, about how we transform India and this idea of green revolution, not the rice and wheat revolution, but the revolution on empowerment of entrepreneurship. And that was launched by Secretary Ashkosh Sharma, <coughs> the Vice Chancellor, last week. So SDGs, wrapping up. The SDGs going forward are an opportunity for India. I know every state in India, and we know every city in China is thinking about how SDG indicators can be put into their framework. It's a beginning of a, a, a discussion. We think maybe the places to go would be eight, good jobs and economic growth, seven partners, 17 partnerships. Now, for each research project, we have a number. So for us, for the one that we're doing, Tigers, we're saying no hunger, good health, education, linked together to, to improve jobs. The reason I'm putting it up is that this could be a way to create, not a template approach, but an approach that could be different for different cities. It doesn't have to be at the country level. 
So, hence the point that it is in sustainability. We can think, for example, SDG 11, which people don't normally talk about, that would be all of us, an academic partnership across different things. We have never put bids together in this way, but the last year and a half we've been thinking, how do we get into these conversations? We've always criticizing them. How do we try and see that we can do something to provide for and so cities can then be social change, and I'm drawing from our colleagues at IIED. They talk about this importance of local government. Think about a local government. For rural, I'd like a cluster of villages. The Commission of District Commission will do that. Working with urban poor, could also be working with the rural poor. Creating those targets ourselves. There's no point in having a target that is universal across India. The target may be very, very different in, in different clusters and co-producing those services. So with the community, the researcher, in our current work with ITIs. I mean, Ministry of Skills has got this huge 500 million loan, but what are the skills? We don't need to talk about more electricians and plumbers. Convert that into discussion about maybe renewable energy, or a discussion <coughs> into thinking about new service provision. You know, we need to think forward rather than be catching that train which has already left the station. And so I'm going to say this because this is the future. All the states that are growing in India, Maharashtra is way ahead, but UP. You know, we've got big states in the middle here who haven't thought through these issues. And, and, and I think that that is why there's an opportunity for us. So I'll end with something that's old and it's been staring us in the face for the last three years. This is not a new... Every year we come up with a shortfall of skills. So there's a huge shortfall of skills. You could think about, I mean, for me, food processing would be the way. And I think rather than saying there's a gap of 9.3 million food processing, my argument means how much of the Indian youth skill set can be moved towards food processing. That would be a completely different way. This is, for me as an economist, the problem with gap analysis. You say, this is where we should be, itre bharto, IT, I mean. Rather than saying reform, think about what do the youth want and refashion what the IT should be for. And this is another way, and recently this was done, rather than thinking of sectors, kinds of skills. And I like that. And that works very closely to my penultimate slide, what the ILO has been saying, that matching supply and demand requires understanding the contextual factors. And that again is quite often district specific. So I'll end by saying, if we want to think about institutional change in this space with youth skills and jobs, we need to focus on both supply and demand. Often the smart cities argument is a supply side argument. We need to work with stakeholders to make that matching more effective. And the implications going forward is we only have a fifth of the formal sector providing jobs. Let's not make the tail wag the dog. Let's not go into a loop that's going to take longer to achieve and is actually very wasteful of resources. Start with the youth who have the educational completion. Think through how that works. <coughs> Their aspirations for what they want. Everyone says they want a Sarkari job. Same thing in China. You ask young people, what do you want? And it's the same argument. Why would they want that? Because either you want to join you know, the government, because then you have a secure job, because you're part of the party, or you want to make money. It's very similar in India. Sarkari Nogri, if not a Sarkari Nogri, could guess that in it. But the future really is thinking about entrepreneurship. The state is not going to be a job provider in these two countries going forward. You cannot provide jobs to 875 million or a billion people. And I don't think the state in China, the state certainly does not want to be a country. And so going forward, we need to think of public policies. That's not the same thing as government jobs. And it has to be with the corporate sector and with civil society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, she just covered a very wide range of issues, so now... I did say the whistle stopped. <laughs> I didn't know the nature of the audience, so I wanted to do something very well. Now the floor is open for comments, questions, discussion. Please, yeah. just try and get rid of the Thank you. Uh, uh, of course, uh, these are daunting challenges that you brought out uh, in your presentation in talking about India and China. Uh, my question actually is this, that uh, already, uh, you know, I think that the policymakers are broadly aware 
uh, exactly where the challenges lie and also perhaps uh, how they would achieve them. The problem really is uh, what kind of methodological studies we actually done, analysis we've done, to say why uh, the instrument that we deploy to achieve these targets, they don't really do that. You know? uh, that, that is really the issue in my view. And, uh, and of course, the, I mean, that's where the, the comparisons are important and perhaps, as I said, to understand where there's convergence and where we have to accept that there is no possibility to close the divergence gap. And that is, for example, the, the Chinese very simple. An acquisition of land is no problem for these fellows. You know, uh, uh, overspending of money is no problem for these chaps. Uh, for Indians, it's a major problem. So, I mean, these are just two things which just leap at you when you start thinking about these issues. But I'm just wondering, uh, to what extent, uh, let's say, these, these competitive exercises uh, uh, can really help us uh, look at these issues much more closely? Because, you know, I would actually give an example. <coughs> Let's take the case of India, urban, rural, sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, migration, or rural, urban migration. Uh, in one way, as you rightly said, that in the case of India, it's still a free market economy. So whenever there is a migration taking place, and it's inevitable, because the agriculture contributes only 14% GDP, and, uh, and, and the pop rural population was 63%, of the Indian population. Obviously, there's a clear imbalance. Yeah. So, <clears throat> naturally, they will travel. The question actually here is that because of the free, free kind of um, economy, therefore, there's a sense as to where jobs are available. Inequality is secondary issue. The first thing is they feel that if they would earn more money in a city than they would earn in the village, then they will come, irrespective of whether they're living next to a high rise building or not. So, the point actually is that here it is quite like that. And therefore, if there is a saturation at some point, then they find some other place. And that way, they're quite free meaning. They go wherever they you know, should be in. And it's, it's basically anecdotal, but they find that the trend develops. In the case of the Chinese, I guess it's much more sort of uh, endless stuff. I would say structure, but if you require a permit system, and you know how to buy part of the permit system, perhaps there is still some kind of a uh, restraint applied to that kind of a migration flow. So I'm just wondering, uh, when we talk in terms of managing the rural, urban, this kind of uh, migration flows, what can we learn from China and, and what we shouldn't actually be looking at China to find solutions for our problems? It is a really good question. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I think it would be right to say that in the last 20 years, the Chinese state has applied less and less of its interest to managing migrant flows. The companies, uh, often SMEs, not necessarily big companies even, um, unlike say in the 1990s with all the SEZs and state control and people were busting into Shenzhen, that was the beginning. Compared to that, we're in a very different world. So you could be a small SME and you could advertise for workers from another province. And you would have the right, having advertised, to get a temporary book made for those workers. So in that sense, I think it would be right to say that Chinese state does not actually manage the Hukou system, though it does exist. But you can apply for it as, as, as a private company. So I think about the most um, loose form of that is when workers come to pick fruit. They come for six months to pick fruit. They literally walk over the provincial border, pick the fruit, go back in three months, and if there's work for them, they call back. You know, they, they speak on WeChat and they're back again. So it's as simple as that. And the state does not really intervene as long as there's actual work going on. So the system of migration has opened up in China as well. It's not in any way similar to India, I agree. As in, in India, the state does not play a role. But in India also, we have forms of informal labor control through the jobbers. Right? So people from Bihar are not getting on the train on their own and finding a job in Panchko. They are being taken by a jobber, in this classic Yadraman sense of managing the labor market. They are traveling across, they are getting a job. So in form, they may be distinctly different. But in the process of labor movement, there are points of regulation pinpointed that you can think of. 
So obviously we do not necessarily in India want a Hutu system. But a system by which labor management occurs, by which, let's say if I'm, I just came back, DLF Valley is being built in Banjkula, and all the labor has come from Bihar, fine, they're being paid. But there might be a system we could think about for which private construction workers or private farmers who are 100 acre holders are paid, need to register the presence of these people and maybe as a result, they will get some facility, like we'll get, you know, greater electricity or water because these people are living in those plastic shack plus tin roofs without water or electricity. So there could be a facility by which the idea of an ethical employer gets some benefit. So, or maybe gets more land, public land on the <coughs> workers. Because I've seen a variation across Punjab in the last three years. And in some districts, the farmer builds a ch channel alongside so there can be sanitation, there can be water, other places nothing at all. So my response to you would be the, rather than looking at the form, which are very different, look at the processes of labor management which are not that dissimilar. And the same thing is true in China. They will put their workers alongside and build them temporary houses. So in practice they're not that that no, so, uh, so what can we learn from China in this case? So what we can learn from China in this case is that to bring in the private sector to the point of SMEs is not impossible in labor management practice. The state only intervenes if a migrant complains and say, I have say been beaten. You know, then you go to the local police station and you file a report and the local state comes in. So the Chinese have learned themselves that the hukou management is a very expensive system. So they have moved away from it. It's also held the implementation. Oh, and it's then so there's a whole book to be written, sir. So we can we can talk about that. <laughs> so that's where the implementation issue left. But you know, I your earlier question. Let me let me answer that and then respond. Your earlier question was: we policymakers know everything. It's the instruments that are the problem. I would beg to. No, know. I don't say that. I don't say they know everything. I say they are broadly aware about okay. the issues. Are but the because they are broadly aware of the issues mm -hmm. and unaware of things like where the data actually contradicts each other. Mm -hmm. The policy implementation is necessarily only half it. Mm -hmm. You cannot create instruments without a detailed survey. <coughs> so you always say an academic would take three years to do it, that's why you're not in policy. I accept that criticism. <laughs> but the point is, if you have a survey of a district in India where you have a large number of laborers coming in, house to home to household, you see the changes in behavior. You can use that district as a model for elsewhere. And that's what happened in China. So as you move from coastal development to westward development, the models that provincial governments are using, for example, in Chongqing and Dansu are very different for the models. And now the NDRC has made that clear. They said the Go West policy will use different models. We do not want to use the models of the coastal cities because it's not true. So that may be a way to think about how effectively there's been a regionalization of development policy, which the NDRC has endorsed. Um, <coughs> well, this is a wonderful presentation, and um, it's absolutely bristling with questions, so one can't ask all of them at once. But the, I, I think you stressed, something, you stressed something which still doesn't come out in the literature and popular thinking and which I think ought to be, because it's been around for a very long time. That is, that everyone thinks that there's rural to urban, to um, big uh, metropolitan uh, migration, and uh, people in Delhi think, oh, the migrants coming, exploding populations. But actually, it, for at least a couple of decades or more, everyone has known that it's into, you know, from rural to rural, and rural to smaller towns and bigger towns and so on that the figures are actually there. Mm -hmm. So the whole beginning point of the bulging metro policy oh, um, yes. and um, I'm thinking of this particularly because I was involved in the production of a, a book uh, edited by uh, Johnny Perry and Young Brennan called The, the Worlds of Indian Industrial Labour. It had a historical dimension too. And that, um, you know, that made that absolutely clear. And among the papers in that was a great um, sort of unpacking of the idea of migration, uh, which you just referred to now, incidentally. That is, 
circular migration. In the summer, people go here. In the winter, they go there. And this season, they go back to harvest their crops and so on like that. So circular migrations from one place to another. And then uh, seasonal or temporary migrations. So unless you unpack the notion of migration, even rural to urban or rural to other types of rural, um, you know, you, uh, you're not going to be getting the complexity of the, the whole thing and the nature uh, <coughs> of informal labor. Because in that book, uh, young women in the town with a very long essay on it. Yes. For you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very well. We've done it many times, but on informal yeah. labor, yeah. as uh, after all, if all Indian labor is 92% or yeah. whatever it is, your figures are 88 currently, but not right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Around, anyhow, it's been around 90% for mm -hmm. so long. The hope for the, the proper employment mm -hmm. is, um, you know, really uh, pie in the sky, and that's why demonetization was such a um, such a difficult experience for so many people that uh, workers just had to disappear and the informal sector was the hardest hit. Uh, then you had said that we mustn't think of the state as a job provider. Um, everyone does, everyone wishes for that. But nor can we think of the private sector as a job provider because the private sector, the smarter it gets, the less employment it offers. So you are in a sort of tangle there, that you, the, the private sector is actually going to get smarter and you know, people will become redundant, which is what is happening. And it is also very um, sort of enmeshed with, in, in global economic trends. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, is, that is not um, a very good idea. And then you made the remark that, uh, well, just two more slight comments. Uh, you said, of course, smart cities. I sort of feel like saying, why of course? Because uh, recent figures show that after announcing this policy of smart cities in, uh, in India, uh, and huge allotments of funds, less than 2% has now been expended. Mm -hmm. And the reasons, the, mm -hmm. the choosing and delineation of smart cities was a, was a terribly political process. Yeah. Uh, you know, there should be this, some from this region and that region and the other region and the other region. Um, with, uh, and master plans. It really seems like you know, how will different municipal authorities could draw up their project programs. Yeah. So I, I would like to commend smart villages, but surely we can't have any more sort of improving slogans without substance. Yeah. We want to know what is the meaning of being smart, especially since, with all the money in the world uh, and all the political will and direction, we've been unable to even kick off this smart city business. So, <coughs> what are we talking about, and where does it, as you pointed out in the first place, where does it lead to improve um, uh, standards of living in, uh, for the very poor? I mean, the, the end to uh, the massive inequality rather than its continued growth. Mm. Because the smart cities you feel will be, a, if they ever happen, will be a very different sort of entity. Uh, the other uh, point you made, uh, <coughs> some, some of our faculty were present when we had a very interesting Chinese visitor uh, just a couple of days ago uh, who had come to the Delhi School of Economics. And he, he was working on climate change and uh, these sort of issues. And his interest was in the gap between central policy and local, that not only provincial, but even local level actualization of that policy. And when some of us muttered that, well, you know, in some of these schemes, there's so, like the infrastructure building, there's so much unhappiness, there's so much displacement, there's so much useless into infrastructure comes into uh, being through crony capitalism. He said, actually, the thing about China is that maybe then they are capable of making mistakes and learning from them. So the old idea that you know that you had models 
and you tried something out in a small place and then you created this was you know, another yeah, yeah. you know, uh, learn from so and so and learn from so and so. Yeah, but yeah. in a way that's a something that's that like that might still be going on. Uh, with local level authorities competing to do with each other to do a better job, including following green standards. So that the better they follow the green standards, the better the rewards, and therefore the better, the more they're funded to do more, and the more other things might be discarded. Because everyone who's seen the China, Chinese countryside, or any city now in India, finds all these huge infrastructure, particularly housing, rising from nowhere, without you know the proper facilities. You don't know whether they'll ever have water. Um, you know. Uh, Real estate collapsing in the present present state, and amazing uh, housing colonies smart in them, their little selves mm -hmm. all around. Mm -hmm. So I think that you know this is also a, a moment for mm -hmm. inter um, interrogation. Mm -hmm. That uh, certainly some things on this climate change and green city competitiveness. Are, are things that we should look, you know, the sustainable, what you call it, sustainability yeah. is yeah. Part, partially that that we call it. Thank you, Patricia. That, I think I would love to have you write the paper and listen to you about this. I'm going to start with the last one first, if I may, and go back, but I think it's absolutely fascinating. So, I'll link that to the smart city commentary. Smart cities, yes, as in we cannot but think about the future big cities where we will collect data so we can try and make people's lives better. But the smart city in Singapore is very different from the smart city in LA. Um, we organized with the Health British Academy Network and last year we had a smart city conference in Bangalore and I have not seen a less smart city in a long time. Mm -hmm. It's my first visit to Bangalore so I have nothing to base it on. Did you see a burning lake? I <laughs> saw a burning lake and white smog and I saw the IT part of the city being the worst with mm -hmm. no trees at all. So, I take your point very, very seriously, um, and maybe that goes back to, to Seth's point earlier. I mean, China has moved away from centralized policy making by putting in its place. Over time, very much crossing the road with the Roping for Stones model that they've had right through the reform, the five phases of reform, but to allow competition to build up is very much their idea. And mayors come and go in relation to their ability to deliver. I mean, the mayor gets axed mm. if they don't do the job. The mayor has a budget. You can be, you know, Genghis Khan and spend it badly or well. You do it badly, you're out. If you do it well, then you rise to the next level. So there is very clearly competition in relation to this. And the smart cities model could have been done in that similar way. I mean, the initial idea <coughs> being you list a set of criteria and then states probably should have got the money after creating those dimensions. Whereas the way the model then rolled up was, you know, you announced the city and then you had to look for the private sector or someone else to get the money. And there's actually no model on the ground. And I mean, Bhuvanesha was, was fascinating. They did really well on the city, community, citizenship involvement. That was partly because of Kit and Kiss. They have a big network on the ground. Their students went and asked people what they wanted. But having gone back to Bhuvanesha, <coughs> there's nothing happening. So it was very sad because Bhuvaneshwar could have been a really powerful way of saying the east of India where there hasn't been, you know, going forward. So I couldn't agree more with you that the way in which the smart city model then rolled out actually worked against the very logic of what it was saying it was going to set out. But globally, being a huge amount of interest in smart cities, particularly with the greening element, I mean, for me, the Singaporean, you know, trees by the bay, was a perfect idea where you said you can have vertical living and you will have growing plants right across your vertical living which would reduce your CO2 uh, emissions and immediately form a way in which you absorb the carbon emissions as you grow taller. That's a very expensive technological solution. But we have lots of young people, we have engineers, it's not as if we don't have human capital if directly we couldn't think of those solutions. And so that's what we needed to think through, rather than becoming a bean counting brownie point exercise about how many things have you got and stop there. So it could have been a PPP model that could work, like the one in Singapore did. A lot more institution building and infrastructural knowledge is, is required for that. So that's where I would answer your last two points. I agree the state, and I say the state can't be providing the Keynesian sense of the 
the employer will ask for so. I very much would like to imagine that's a world, but we do not have the financial revenue system in which that's possible. And so I use PPP as a way not to say, okay, this is a magic mantra, but if the state and the private sector are made accountable to civil society as three parts of a triangle, then you could think that this could work. So this is what this is the conversation I'm having now with Ministry of Skills, because they're saying, okay, well, you're working in India for four years, you're talking about skills, this is what we're doing. So it's the beginning of a very small conversation, maybe it brought pick up. And so I said the same thing to them. I said, think about where you want to be in 10 years and train them for that. Don't think using this deficit model of education. You have to tenth fail here, so that's all they're able to do. The kids who go through that at 14 and 15 and do that simply want a certificate to apply for something else. And where the skill has improved, and there are some ITIs which are nodal ITIs are doing much better, because of the bad history of the ITI, the companies don't believe the state government that done the training. Yeah. So you can't go back. That's a path dependency problem, we'd say. So you've got to move to a new skill set which isn't redolent with the problems of the past. So, you know, you have to create new skills which then you tell a private provider, you work with these people for two years and you know, you will get some kind of scheme in which you can work with us to try and tell us what you want. So it has to be an intellectual shift in thinking about how you do this co-creation. It just cannot be a system where you think these are the dross of society, they can't do anything else. Because those who want to engineering in college aren't being engineers either. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. fundamental shift that we need to think about where education fits into educational employment. So, and the cultural shift? Of course, absolutely. Without a doubt. In the values that is given to certain sort of work as against other mm -hmm. sorts of work. Yeah, absolutely. Like the old Chinese one, <laughs> those who work with their minds, yeah. or, you know, a gentleman, those, the others yeah, are something yeah, absolutely. else. Uh, and work um, with your hands is satisfying. Uh, so blue collar, white collar distinctions exist usually, and, and, and this is a very major part. Um, and interestingly, they re-emerge in China as well. As people become work harder for the Gao Kao and get to university and do that master's degree, they are quite dismissive of jobs which are required mm -hmm. to work with mm -hmm. So it, it it's an interesting feature. In fact, <coughs> I feel the conversations with, with Globalizing Chinese and globalizing Indians are becoming more similar. and more similar among under 25s. Including telling me my computer was very old because it's four years old. <laughs> both, both. <coughs> the computer, this is, you know, I was like, wow. Okay, so I'm like, you know, out gen generationalized in that way as well. <laughs> Your point about certainly the migration I take, the work with Priya Shinkar and others have done mm -hmm. a number, yeah. very powerful, but I think those patterns are also changing. So I'm actually sort of asking for a block cluster, maybe just one block cluster in different regions to actually map it out in its entirety. And I think after the informal labor, you know, kind of work in 2011, we haven't had a great deal. So, that, you know, before the next census, it would be nice to get something in place. Otherwise, we'll wait for after 2020 and then we'll have, we know there's some really nice stuff in the 2011 census that's there. So it would be nice. I say, Sasar, if you're listening, can you do something, please? So I would I would answer that. But thank you so much for your questions. They were extremely helpful. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Please Let's put my hand down for a minute. Now I'm Terry. Uh, I work as uh, associate fellow here. Um, not totally related, but somewhat still related. Perfect. I've been listening to a lot of podcasts uh, on uh, like there's this podcast called Upstream. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. They talk a lot about uh, post-capitalist economy and post-work economy. And that looks at uh, development in a very different ideological framework itself changes. Mm -hmm. So that would make migration redundant in itself. And I think even the dichotomy between urban and rural in that sense would just be relevant over there in that kind of a system. Mm -hmm. Because one would then, <coughs> so they're talking about promoting social entrepreneurship where you stay within your own place where you are based. So you have that local resource in the sense of different capital, social, political capital, even financial, or even cultural capital that you have, which you galvanize to then you know, become build a social entrepreneurship. <coughs> so you give back to society. So you don't need to move. So, uh, But of course, government needs to provide for education and other stuff within that kind of system. So you don't need to move. Then even for like person like many of us are migrants here in Delhi, you need to move out. So many difficulties of being a migrant, like having a kid, then you don't have parents with you. And then when parents become old, you are not with them. There are so many social uh, complications that arise. So do you think like people are experimenting on this kind of uh, economy like in uh, parts of Europe, apparently? 
So do you think it's very idealistic? I mean, what is your take on something like this? Is it feasible for uh, our parts of the world? So, um, <coughs> it's a really valid question. And it's because I was talking to my students in Shanghai, Japan, about And they were saying, we don't actually travel <coughs> across the city of Shanghai anymore. We just live in North Shanghai, we cook in North Shanghai, our kids are there, we, we don't really know the rest of the city. It could be, you know, there is no way that I'm mm -hmm. going to, you know, spend more than a 10 kilometer radius going and coming to work because I spend all my time doing that. Mm -hmm. And so then you go to the metro on the weekends, you know, to visit somebody in some other, it's like, it's almost like there are towns within the cities. Mm -hmm. And so in Shanghai there are now 17 districts. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the Shanghai administration is beginning to do, and as mentioned so short when we were having lunch last month, that they've actually designated nine of their districts as rural districts. This has nothing to do with where people are coming from. But they will be where urban agriculture is developed. So that you don't have to travel to the other end of the city, even for your vegetables, or for the park, or for the boating, all the things that you would do. So even your weekends, you don't have to travel right across the three and a half hours. Instead, people are going out of the city to other places. So it's kind of changing the way, and then they get on a train, which means they're not using cars and, and transport, reducing the, the congestion that Shanghai has. And so there is a way of thinking, even in an urban space, the idea is that people can live and work. Uh, in relation to local citizenship. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what Shanghai is the first uh, of, the, of the Chinese cities that's going for that, and I think it's quite an interesting idea. It's also linked particularly to the point I was making about women and women's rights. They find that women in particular have very long days, mm -hmm. and often have to use a large amount of social network to get the kids to school. And then of course, Gaokao also means tuition class, right? Yeah. So then there's this whole thing about school and tuition, and, and it just... Yeah. Extra classes. <laughs> so, and, and again, Part of the story in China is like migrants coming to Delhi from elsewhere, the families are not there. So it is, it is a challenge to think about. It. So I think there are clearly ways in which urban municipal citizenship thinking can help. The slight um, caveat I would put on the question you're asking is when people say, oh, this is a, you know, it's, it's something that high income countries can do. I think mobility is something that we need to think about for all countries at whatever level of development. And so I think if we're going to wait, I'm not saying India was saying that, but I'm saying a lot of the narrative coming out of the global north is, you know, this is something you can do at a higher level of income development. It doesn't have to be. And here is where I think the smart of smartness comes. You know, you can have information platforms and all sorts of things. I mean, Indians, we like eating and drinking and shopping. And our Amazon mm -hmm. things are all about eating and drinking. I mean, we have more, you know, food critic stuff happening than any other part of the world. We can start thinking about the way we, we might like to crowdsource, to find information, but it has to be led in local space rather than big commercial space. And there's a different purpose for why companies do AI, and a different purpose for why communities might want to make changes. So, you know, it, well, WhatsApp, right? My entire last project, all my data was sent on WhatsApp by my teams in Tamil Nadu. It was no question of Excel spreadsheet and everything was just WhatsApp, you know? It, it really made me think about Okay, there's a new language in town that we could actually plug into in terms of thinking about people too. So that would then become another layer of local living. That you don't need to do these other things. But what I worry about is that that happens without plugging into the local community. Kids need to work the soil. Kids need to know what the, the environment. They need to know that milk comes from cows and not from bottles. Right, so when you start thinking about those, they need it tell, and I think the cultural shift is so central. So it's it's really about rebalancing. So when we do our surveys, we ask people, what do you value? And often people value that relationship between local nature and how they spend their lives. And that gives them the greatest the happiness index that economists like talking about. A lot of the immediate gratification comes from those things. So that Ma'am, I'm Colonel Ajay. I had a question with respect to a slide which you had shown uh, in which Maharashtra is quite ahead yeah. and UP is, is quite behind. And if MP, we're still ahead of some of the others. Yeah, but MP is quite behind. Uh, case in point is of uh, a city that is in Dawn, uh, which has come in the last That's 10 years. That's a smart city. That's a smart city. <laughs> if you look at Indore in the last 10 years and the area around Indore, I would say to the tune of around about 50 to 100 kilometers all around Indore. The villages, they have progressed tremendously. It is basically just because of one reason, because Indore has come up and it is connected to Bombay. 
the amount of cold storages which have come up in and around Indore, basically what is being produced in the villages is being processed and being sent to Bombay. Uh, the biggest angry as far as Tata is concerned is in Devas. The maximum amount of chips which are produced is in and around that place. Mm. And they are sent all over the country. A uh, case in point I wanted to ask you was, uh, the way Indore has progressed and it has in ensured that the area around it has also progressed mm. in the similar fashion. Especially the ladies in the household, in the villages, they have got a lot of employment. We can cater for the men folk if they come to the city. It is basically the ladies who are there and the older generation which is there who can still do a little bit amount of work. So in terms of the question was related to smart cities only, uh, you've already answered that. But do we need to progress into a fashion in which we make a city and we make something in such a fashion that the produce or whatever is being produced in the villages around gets processed and is thereafter able to be able to set it up? It's a superbly important question. I have a colleague at um, IIT Mumbai, Narayanan, who does a lot of agricultural diversification work um, uh, for the government of India. And they were studying the right around Madhya Pradesh. And a lot of their studies also show exactly what you're saying, that the greatest success is where you include the village community, and particularly where women manage the resources, because then it balances out the finances, what they're doing, and how they're working. So the point I made in my earlier side is the only way that we can think about agriculture in the future is through diversification. Now, we've had seva, we've had you know, a whole lot of pickles, papar, a whole lot of wonderful activities. You need a higher value scale up. So the idea of your, your idea of the cold storage is a fantastic one. The question is, can you think about a future, and I don't see why not, where the women are becoming managers and then the marketeers of that same product? And that will go back to my first answer about SMEs. Mm -hmm. We don't need to only think of the large corporate players. They're going to do what they're going to do. You know, Godrich Fresh is going to be there. It's going to cater for another market in your urban city. But you need to think about these other alternatives. And I think that this is the area that really is the most valuable. So on our Tigris project, we're talking about what is the new face of the Green Revolution, and we think it's Indian women. There is no other sense in terms of the migratory patterns of men and women and what's happening. Um, one of my students is working in Maharashtra, and she's working in three districts, and one of the districts is one of the wine-producing districts. And, and the, her ace leader is a 22-year-old woman who has been working in this sector since she was 16. She's brought in the new grapes. And in the last interview, which uh, we've just um, decoded, she just said, and when I marry, my husband's going to come and live in my village. Because I've done this. And he can come and join me if he likes. And he can be whatever he likes, but we're going to work in this village. This kind of idea of someone with 10 acres of land who feels that they can make a difference to actually turn it. And everyone in the village thinks that she is a repository of knowledge of what to do if they're going to create a, a winery. I mean, that's going to be amazing if they're going to do that. But this is something that 10 years ago, people said, oh, Indian wine, you know, nobody can drink it. There's a huge shift. So I think what you're saying is the future in terms of empowering local communities. <coughs> Uh, vocational education is doing very well in China when the TV is not conditioned. Okay? And then in the later stage one finds that when uh, children finish the nine years of compulsory education, most parents who can afford it want them to join university. Now, as a result, universities have expanded like anything, but there aren't that many jobs. Okay? And, but on the other hand, <coughs> uh, multinational companies and others complain that they don't get enough qualified people. They have the job, they don't get enough people. Okay. In India, a similar problem, 400,000 um, people get engineering degrees every year, <laughs> and only 100,000 get <coughs> sorry, jobs as engineers, the others do various other things or they don't have jobs or they under the, you know, leave the country or whatever. And, you know, perhaps that many people should not you know, become full-fledged engineers. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you know, skill development has been given so much stress. Now, in skill development, you have, you know, 
you want to skill people who have finished, say, class five or class eight of school, and then you know so that they can be part of the manufacturing sector. Okay, China has benefited greatly, you know, by creating a manufacturing sector, which India now needs. Now the problem is that you know people with class five and class eight education in India are don't really learn anything. Okay. They can't do basic arithmetic. They can't write a sentence. Forget about English. Their you know local languages are also known. Now in that situation, how can a massive skill development program succeed? Since you are working in this area, I would like to hear your views. And I, after the seminar is over, I want to talk to you also about the possible <laughs> seminar that we will be doing this morning. I think you raised a really really important question. So yes, if we think, and I think the points I made are in terms of thinking about instruments, and instruments have to be worked in what we call sequential <coughs> order, so that one sequential, sequential order, order, so it works between one and the other. I think the country that we know did that really well was South Korea in terms of expanding its uh, industrial policy along with improving and increasing the educational skill over a 10, 12 year period, so the cohort that starts at age 5 is 16 and going to jobs. China has had a slightly un more uneven story, but they've managed to do that kind of streamlining through this. So as the TVEs were giving way to moving from vocational to actually converting TVEs into SMEs and between, as you know better than me, by the time we get to the 1990s, the entire TV sector is now called small industry, right? So that, that classificatory system also takes place. Um, as a consequence of that, there was a period of actually a, quite a disappointment in youth populations, as you rightly said, uh, because they were not getting the SESZ jobs. Um, the TVs were becoming part of the subcontracted system for the coastal area, and suddenly their qualification status was not good enough. And so the third generation of migrants we know go out further, look for less well-paid jobs, there's more dis disenchantment in them. And this is part of the reason that the Chinese government, because it doesn't want to take on that responsibility, understand it because it's a black mark, have opened up the discussion, let SMEs, let others train. And they are quite happy for that sector not to have trained people. But a lot of young people want to train and go out for jobs. And China has a similar problem to our South Indian engineering you know, colleges. Degrees that are not worth the paper they're in. And they take debt. So in China, people take a loan to go to university. They're not done well in the Gaoka. You have to pay. You don't well in the Gaoka, you get you know a reduction. You may even get full fee reduction. You've got to pay. Parents who are in their 60s, we wrote a paper which just come out in China quarterly, where parents in their 60s have taken loans to support their children through education and then as a migrant adult who's not been able to get a job. And they're working in things like brick kilns. So it's not dissimilar to the difficulties we see in rural India. It may be a smaller percentage, but there are families, particularly in Northeast China, Ilongjiang, Jilin, who are in severe financial difficulty. So that, that is an issue. So I think that's a problem. And China, like in India, has status subjects. You know, it's very hard for a child to say, I want to humanities. Mm -hmm. Parents are going to say, very much like Indian parents, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, it becomes very difficult. And social sciences has taken quite, humanities in particular, quite a knock in China. So. It then only becomes possible if you have enough money, you say, okay, I'll do art school and then I'll go abroad. Or, you know, I'll, I'll somehow find a social capital avenue that will give me. So the hierarchization of educational choices in universities is also true. And, and like in India, everyone wants to get to that top university, not because it has the best course, but because it's the best social capital to give them an out, whether that's through the multinational job or actually going abroad. And I think that issue is there. So that's of those who succeed. Now coming to the bottom end, as the reports year on year have been telling us that the quality of education in India is very poor. Um, I don't think the skill sector can address anyone who's not completed class 10. At the moment, that's not what the model is for. It is for those who complete. But if we're thinking of addressing that three gap, I was talking about educational gap, skill gap, and employment gap, then it becomes critical that we fundamentally restructure our primary education system. We have not addressed this issue, whether it's in terms of, I mean, very basic thing. If you can't speak and write and read in your mother tongue, you're not going to be able to do it in national language, and certainly not going to do it in English. So what we have is a veneer of education. In fact, a PhD student just finished this, and she examined 
young people who've done their education in Hindi in, in Delhi and Punjab and those who had done it in English. And the only ones who were able to jump over that barrier after we interviewed people 15 years after and those who are now are people with social capital and, and financial capital. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a job in your father's uh, sh shop and through that you acquire proficiency, the next 10 years your English ability goes up, your financial ability goes up, you might do better. But for people who leave and simply enter the employment market willy-nilly, they have much more fractured employment and no improvements. And they regard the lack of English or other abilities as a major structural obstacle. So we are seeing, and that's why I put the point about structural obstacle in, that we are seeing that we have created a deficit in these five-year-olds by the time they become 14 years. And so their decision to exit is not an irrational decision. Now, if we're willing to take that on headlong, then we might make a difference in this country. If we're not, <coughs> we're going to stay with this deficit model. I, 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 I talk to head teachers, and they come to Cambridge, and they have a program. I talk every year based on the research I've done in India. Very clever people who become head teachers who are actually really committed to us and we're not going to get on a you know training program for, for to go abroad. And one of them said to me very sadly, Madam said, So I said, But the five year old has just started school, how can they be stupid? He looked at me and said, Oh, kabhi kisi ne aise I said, this boy or girl has just entered school, how can they be stupid? Are you speaking to a language you don't understand? Are you presuming they've studied before? He was a physics teacher before he began. And he came back to me at the end of the three days and said, that really changed the way I thought about it. So I shouldn't be shouting at the five-year-old. I said, absolutely not. So just basic <coughs> understanding. Because, and he's right. He said, I've got a school full of kids. You know, this is not that he's not a good teacher. I need to get the level up. The parents are shouting at me. This kid has to read. And I said, you need to do a lot more remedial teaching in year one. Mm -hmm. I'd rather you start doing remedial teaching. Change the way you teach language, you know? But, of course, they're stuck with the CBSC or the state board. Mm -hmm. So the teachers who are good teachers and end up being good principals, and these are all their schools, and they're not bad, mm -hmm. are deeply frustrated by the fact that they're not able to do critical thinking. Mm -hmm. This is at the core of what we need to do. I mean, the reason we are all here is because we went to some school somewhere that somebody thought they were clever enough to learn to write. And didn't say I'm a Buddha. If I was told I'm a Buddha, I would have gone home and never come back to school. <laughs> so I think these are sort of yeah. very basic. I'm making anecdotal only because, you know, to, to go back to the question of instruments, you really need to have timed instruments over the first five years of a child's life to say that every time you make a mistake, you talked about mistakes, right? Making a mistake is the best way for a child to learn. So if you put a red mark in the child's book and the child goes on and gets shouted at by its parents, mm -hmm. you've already started doing the damage. And I don't think it's better anywhere else in the world. In Britain, we have suddenly said, oh, we're in China. Singaporeans do so well. Let's introduce rote learning into the schools. I want to go and hang out with the table now. <laughs> and it's a small little island somewhere in the North Sea. It doesn't matter. But, you know, there you go. Shivati's book on vocational education actually is no, coming out. Not so wonderful. Sorry, nice. con conference on vocational yeah, education. Oh, it's so a later conference later this month. So, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Anand? Um, thanks, Anand. It was really uh, wonderful. I had just two uh, points. One was when you mentioned uh, Chungjing and the uh, rural to urban. I think Chungjing also has a model which was followed. I mean, I don't know the percentage, but it was in a sense that the rural urban integration was also in the sense that if you had, I mean that also involved a lot of real estate. Of so if there was a rural land and that rural land, the option was to sell that sell rural land the and then uh, get that uh, developed yeah. and that person might get an urban buko. Correct. So I mean that sort of integration was also tried out but I mean a lot was happening one. under Porshila and uh, that kind of model. Porshila kind of left and they changed. Yeah, so, so that's what that's it happened. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that rural uh, urban uh, integration sort of uh, just applied on that one. But the second point which I wanted to ask was, especially when you're talking about skills and the fact that uh, you cannot depend on the government sector anymore for jobs, uh, there's this uh, thesis called the Precariat Thesis, yeah. which is by uh, Guy Stanley, and uh, he talks about uh, the dangers of, uh, I mean, the, he talks about the two sides of mm. who the underclass is, and this is a class which is 
not dependent on or who are not getting, but then there's also the flip side that, uh, I mean, it might range into, I mean, he further divides into, classifies into three kinds of precariousness. So how do you sort of fit that into, because a lot of this we can relate in terms of, even in India or even in China, for example, Uber drivers. So those, those are big case of people who are in this precarious class. Mm -hmm. So in this of your analysis and your field study in both India and China, mm -hmm. how do you sort of fit this kind of crisis into uh, behavior research? That's a very, very good question. I'll start with Chongqing as the example to lead into the answer. So Chongqing was interesting. So in 2000, from 2003, they had conversations on how they were going to do the transformation. And I was fortunate enough to be a member of the team that was invited from UK. They wanted experts. And they thought the experts would rubber stamp and say, how amazing you're doing these things. But unfortunately, being academics, maybe they should have had policy makers. We were a bit difficult. We asked questions. So one of the things that they said is precisely what you described so nicely, that, well, we'll take the land away from them in the rural, and they will sell that land, and we'll create an urban. And then they may get a book. And I saw the question. A number of them are saying, oh, well, suppose they want to go back. It's just point about return migration. How do they actually want to live in the city? They come to the city for a job. Now, if tomorrow Chongqing stops doing construction work, there is no job for them. They're going to be urban poor. <coughs> we thought about that first. Second, given the existing practice in 2003, and we just begun work in the Northeast at that time, we belong to other places. We were aware that what is said in terms of payment and what is given is a big gap. A whole bunch of um, Tumshin, we actually gave it a new term. It's actually hierarchical giving rather than guangxi. So guangxi you give because you're the official, you take money. And they're creating this new idea, guangxi, which they're saying is we're giving to each other. This is like an SFG group, self-help group. But it's not coming out of motivation, it's coming out of the difficulties of managing to get a bank loan. So in a way, it is like the precariat. And there are 60, 65, 70 year olds. Disability is not recognized, so often there are people whose child is unable to work and then they have to support the system because there's not enough recognition of what is disability. Unless you have an accident, they don't need to get money, so if a child has uh, either physical or mental challenges, they're not sure how to work with that. So there's a whole bunch of unknowing and everything only comes through the village official, who is then in turn told by uh, someone sitting at the district level what. So, you do have precariat even within the system without necessarily uh, the movement to a migrant area. So a lot of work about the left behind intergenerational problem is now becoming the new research people are doing. Mm -hmm. So grandparents and grandchildren, mm -hmm. with that middle generation just not being there, but not necessarily giving enough remittances as in the first three migration years. Mm -hmm. so this becomes a problem as well. So that's one thing that I might like to share with Chongqi. And of course, Chongqing officials, you know, they push because of political strength, but they're not got the 25 million. And Chongqing is not a city that I would say could get smart city status even in the Indian criteria. I mean, if you use the same criteria we had. The other thing which is really interesting, there was no definition of minorities in any of their activity of world. Which is bizarre if you've been to Chongqing because Chongqing is a complete crossover form. Oh, but, but, but they're all happy. Like, their kids will not speak the language, you know, so you actually give them a hook how are they going to study in school, and we're going to get my daily principal problem of the children are stupid at age five. Right? So you're getting all sorts of challenges here which are not being recognized. And so my point about the sustainability inclusions are priors to smartness. You cannot do smart without inclusion. You need to know what your population base is by its own characteristics. You then need to think, is your financial instrument of buying land sustainable? What happens if there is a demand from one third of the city they want to go back? Where are you going to go? Their idea was, oh, we're creating an ecological park where those people were. We'll bring tourists in. Yeah, you're creating back, a road for your back, even in a society which is, which is planning. And then, okay, go she like boss, then what happens, right? So there are, there are huge issues of um, sustainability even across political leadership, which were not thought. Uh, and so your idea of precariat becomes much more relevant when you start asking the <coughs> questions. I would not think there's a notion of a national Chinese precariat. I would not even think there's a provincial level. There's a notion of precariat, like in India, from the village, as Patricia said, right through the chain to where they end. And your precariousness will only come if you do a process like it. Because things that we learned was by repeat visits to the village, where we got these stories. And there's, there's a sense of collective pain in this whole two-chain relationship. 
There's a generation who actually believes that they've lost out. The 60-year-olds, and they're going to live till they're 80. They don't have the same health insurance as those elsewhere. <clears throat> they're not putting enough into it because they're sending money out. So there is a fragility in this system. There's an unraveling. Um, and there's a lot of concern. So though there is health insurance, it's... So when you have cancer, <coughs> your health insurance will get you the operation. But if you need drugs for the next four years, you probably won't. That's it. But it's better than not getting the operation. <laughs> And the Chungjing experiment was more like real estate. I mean, it was. But it was, but it was very important because every province wants to do the same thing. Real estate, you will know better than me. Is the counter cyclical financial policy in China? There's no doubt about it. The reason that the NDRC gives money to those reasons is to ensure there is some counter cyclical policy to those things. Okay. One last question. Okay. Um, so, sort of linking two different things you said together. The first thing that you started with what that we need to think about what youth wish to do. And then the thematic of much of what you're saying is sort of on this idea of local communities and, and sort of the contradiction that, that what youth want to do is also different in different places because it's affected by their immediate experiences and migration and mobility then carries back stories that then changes those aspirations. So all of this is this very confusing muddle. But to come back to the local, do you think I mean, in India, I work in secondary cities and really small cities on, on issues of migration and labor. <coughs> and I find that uh, from an institutional perspective, um, there's a lot of, uh, when things change really fast, the private sector, uh, education institutions, the job market can actually change quite fast to adapt. But from a governance perspective, the, the local governance institutions are absolutely clueless about the changes that are happening on the ground many times. Uh, so uh, from an India-China comparison perspective, of, uh, you gave a lot of examples about cities in China and we wouldn't be able to even give examples of that about cities and decision making about mobility in India because cities don't think about mobility. So my question is really this sort of multi-level governance and mobility and can there be some cross-learning uh, across India and China on that? So I think the thing that really would provide a lens, um, which is now an area of high interest in, I don't even have to say one better one word, just say infrastructure. Okay, so if you think about infrastructure in both China and India, that's an area, and that relates to quantum making real estate. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving real estate the bad name, I'm simply saying the big guns mm -hmm. are in areas of infrastructure. In China it used to be housing earlier because they're thinking about migrants, now it's roads because they're thinking about mobility in terms of getting people back. Uh, anyone who's gone to Spring Festival last week would know all you do is stand at the station for hours before you get a train, right? So we know there are problems in these countries. So infrastructure is really a window that they're looking at at the moment. That might be a way to reconceptualize what is the region mm -hmm. in both these countries. Right? So if I'm coming from the agricultural point of view, I will always look at the agroecological. If you're coming from the city's point of view, you might be looking more in relation to what people say in terms of what is the remit of your circular migration. Has the radius changed? Has the temporality changed? Has the seasonality changed? What's most interesting for me is the gaps in the seasonality. So in China, people went from holiday six weeks to nine weeks. That's basically unemployment. It's a nice way of putting it. It's going to come back two months after the pandemic. It's story. Stay at home for another three weeks. Um, so when you start looking at that, then suddenly the story of spatial inequality becomes much more meaningful. So very few people in Beijing and Shanghai are new migrants. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are migrants who move from the outside of Shanghai's circularity to come inside. Right? And anyone who's today sitting in Sichuan is thinking, am I going to even make it to Chongqing? Mm -hmm. So suddenly, the spatiality has gone smaller. The seasonality has gone up. If you had an index of risk, which is how you probably measure precarity if you're an economist, you'd have a huge variation in the standard deviation. So when you start looking at that, then you say, okay, so I could do two things. I could go for the worst case scenario. So I have my furthest away from, and so then, and this is what Beijing is doing. It's really interesting in gender equality. They want to support migrant women who have the least information. But the state says they can't do it. So they have created NGOs. They don't call NGOs, they call civil society organizations. In this, they call them neighborhood committees. So there are neighborhood committees who are trained lawyers, <coughs> but not from Beijing, from 
Hubei or from outside because they understand that change. And they are the ones who are negotiating how these women would be able to make a case. For example, if the child got kicked out of the school mm -hmm. because they were stupid and fine. Um, and so that is the way in which you start thinking about the story and then you, it becomes more manageable that for different infrastructural deliveries, you may have different specialities. Mm -hmm. And actually, to, to, to be fair, I mean, in Shanghai, the government is suddenly recognizing this is important because what they want to see is the delivery on the ground. So they, have, they don't have the instruments. We'll give you the financial devolution, you do it. And then we'll check if we like it. If we like it, we'll adopt it as national policy or official policy. If not, we will leave it in that space of neighborhood committees. Which means we don't have to clean up the mess of the if it's a failure. Okay. But in the case of gender equality, it worked well because it created CEDO committees which were below provincial level. And this year there's a conversation, major conversation across China and the women's federations about how they might have different approaches to regarding the issue of domestic violence. So there's some very interesting learning on the gender dimension. I just want to ask one question. You know, one strong point in China in the reform process has been, you know, this bottom up approach. Yeah. That you experiment, you know, simply, <coughs> and then you come to certain conclusions, you scale it up, you know, roll out on a larger scale. But with the growing centralization of political authority, mm -hmm. is that the bottoms up movement taking place, because one saw things like Belt and Road Initiative, uh, it came straight from top, no one didn't come across any big debate taking place, it, it was straight coming from Xi Jinping, and in fact we rolled out. It took some time to work out you know, our details, because the basic concept is that <coughs> areas you're looking at, you know, your field studies, uh, you still come across you know, the old uh, model <coughs> of crossing the river, feeding the two, etc., etc., or not happening at all? That's such a very powerful question, Ashok, and one that I'm, I'm in considerable turmoil over with my PhD students from China and those who are back working as associate professors. There's, there's concern, there's unknowing. Academics are being told they can do research on important <coughs> topics. Um, and so what they're doing is not uh, uh, being confrontational, trying to think. So I was invited to Shanghai World Forum in 2016. We were allowed to speak about inequality. I used some of the slides I've just worked out that data at the time. There wasn't a concern, but it was, we can't forego growth to take care of inequality. So if a city is wealthy enough to take care of inequality, then it might. And that might be my best way of coming in when you have these very strong central policies like Obor, which are saying, okay, this is what the country is going to do. Most academics, as well as private investors in China, are saying, all right, let's take a topic that is related to infrastructure investment. Mm -hmm. So in the agricultural end, a lot of the people I've been having conversations who are saying, mm -hmm. let's go forward, want to do things like high value agricultural products. So that they can be part of that trade initiative. So if the Belt and Road Initiative works, and there's a line through Neymongu, then I can sell carrots to Russia. You know, they're, they're, they're thinking in these slightly <laughs> interesting ways. And you think, same thing in Kazakhstan, there are so many Chinese investors <coughs> going over the border. There was the CNN program I did about recently. And, but we saw this on the other side, on the Kazakh side. They're just building hotels in the hope that these people will come on that road and they'll be there. One hopes that the hotels will work. But they are sufficiently willing to use the fact that, okay, if it is a strong government, the road will probably happen. So let me put my eggs in that basket. But it's a high risk strategy. So. The Chinese are building hotel in Kazakhstan? Yeah. With Kazakh partners. So they're using the same 49, 51% equity relationship. But, so I've been talking to people from Beijing and saying, okay, carrots, pomegranates, you know, what should we be selling? So it is a bit like us in India saying, okay, we want to trade a new part of the world. What do so there's, there's not a lot of knowing. Um, it's not, it's so different from the SEZ model that, you know, it, it, it's, it's fascinating to see how the SEZ itself, though it was a huge success in the 1990s, was so much crossing the river with groping the stone. This is a new political philosophy. This is something, when you talk to vice governors of provinces or others as private officials, they're saying just, we're just watching and waiting in this space, but we are not going to invest. The private sector needs to, because they, they will be able to. 
we don't want to do the wrong thing. So they they are supporting private investment in their own provinces rather than you know what they would have done in the, the first phase, which is we will lead by example, we will test it. It's a very different field. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah. If you have some time, no, I think. Of course, we'll be very happy to do it. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure and honor to speak with you.